So my family's been on this land for 375 years. We're standing here on a Celtic hill fort. The roundhouses can be seen here. And um, yeah, this place is steeped in history. This is the first ever axe factory in the world going back to Metholithic times, 8,000 years. Good boy. I love, as I'm getting older, to enjoy the history and to enjoy the wildlife and the unique habitats we've got here on the Cadenetai Mountains. So I live just down here in St. Clairvan and in the summer, you know, early morning, I'll go out and I'll have a coffee on the veranda and I'll hear the chuffs flying over. And do you know what? It's just absolutely amazing. It fills my heart with joy every time I hear them in the morning. I'll, I'll try and demonstrate the noise, but um, I don't know how good it is, but it's ah, ah, and I just, just hear them coming across here and they're heading over for Garrick Bowd. And they're nesting on the quarry there in old buildings. They've locked them up, the quarry people have locked them up, so they're safe, so there's nobody going there. There's people there monitoring them, which is amazing. But we're learning a lot more about that bird we're learning there's a lot of chuffs here for a reason. And we never knew it, but we are beginning to understand. So the Carnedi ponies, ponies that have run up here since the Celtic times, there's 220 breeding mares left in the world and they're here on the mountain. We manage them. We bring them in once a year, but they don't get any antibiotics. They don't get any wormer. So it's survival of the fittest. But what we didn't understand was, when these ponies are grazing, so they graze a little bit differently to the sheep. And of course, after they've grazed, it comes out the other end, and the muck then falls to the ground, but it draws in the invertebrate. All types of different insects will be in that dung, breaking it down. And what do the chuff do, and other birds? They absolutely love it. And that's why their population has multiplied here in this area. And that just shows how fragile the circle is, but how important that circle is, that them ponies are helping, you know, the natural cycle of that bird up here. Because it's a beautiful, beautiful type of bird, you know, out of the crow family, and I love seeing them. And I think when you walk around our farm, and have an understanding of what we do here. You can see then the different habitats, you know, from the valleys that you see underneath us here, you know, 200 acres of ancient trees. And that would have been a kind of rainforest of its type. You know, it's all natural, it's all been left. Then we come up onto the Carnedi Mountains then, where we've got the blanket bog, you know, where we've got the montane heath, where we've got the amazing areas of heather for the black grouse and, you know, for different birds up here, the twite as well, are up on the Carnedi. And, you know, you can see all the birds of prey are up here. We've got the red kite coming here in my lifetime. You know, as a boy, I'd never seen one. And in 2013, they came back here. You know, so th there is an array of wildlife here but as well we have to remember we're producing food up here as well you know and getting that balance right is very very important and keeping the balance you know with number of foxes for example we uh, have a few people that come that are paid um, in 2006 we um, set up the first ever PLC Grazing Society in the UK, Aber and Llamavechan Graziers PLC. And 22 farmers came together. We had money from the National Park, money from Europe, and from the CCW, as it was then. And these monies were there to look at different ways we could maybe change a little bit of the way that we were farming up here. So we decided with some of the people that we weren't going to turn any of the sheep up onto the hill for the winter. So the mountain gets time to recharge its batteries, rejuvenate over the winter months, which are the hardest months. And um, 
we close the gates to the mountain on the 26th of October and open it again then on the 1st of April. And it's an amazing sound. You just heard the chip. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. And, and, and that's just... That's just one of them noises that you just love to hear. It is. I didn't quite get it right, but... <laughs> Near enough. Near enough. And, you know, when we brought this agreement in, 22 farmers get them to agree not to put the sheep in. It was difficult, but we've been doing it since 2006, and we've seen now, you know, we've, we've got money for different things, so we pay people to come in and keep the, the number of foxes down on the mountain with rifles. And... We, as a fa you know, as farmers, it would take a lot of time. But when you've got a little bit of money to do that, we're seeing the numbers now of the black grouse coming back. It's fantastic to see it. You know, I'm collecting the sheep in the spring, and then there's a flush in front of me. A flush, you know, and I shoot. You know, I, I love shooting pheasant, partridge, and, and, and it's part. But I love seeing these birds as well, you know, and seeing them coming back. We're not shooting them because we know they want time to get their numbers up. And once they're at a sustainable amount, then we can take a few for ourselves, you know, to eat. And I think that's important. We have to address that balance. 30 odd years ago, my father had noticed um, there's quite a few people coming here to, you know, to control foxes and do other things. But he noticed that the number of mountain hares were going down. So we told everybody that came here not to shoot any of the hares. When we come up here at the night now, I can count 15, 20 hares here. And you know, it's lovely to see. And them hares will be feeding other creatures as well, from the foxes to, 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 to whatever it is. But it's that balance. Sometimes you just have to look at the landscape and what's there, and you have to address it to make sure that we're protect, protecting the habitats and the creatures that are here. And it's not just the big creatures, the smaller creatures as well. Because we look at them, you know, our habitats and we look at the blanket bogs. You know, if, if they're not watched after, we can lose them. We can lose them. We look behind us, the Carnedi Mountains, 27,000 acres of open mountain. That is one of the biggest carbon stores anywhere that's storing more carbon than any forestry in the uk now when we're grazing that properly we're grooming that mountain you know so the grasses the different habitats the heather gorse whatever it is when that is grazed it regrows and when it regrows it sequence into the ground the carbon and that's why you know, it's so unique. So we need to graze it. We need to make sure that we're not overgrazing or undergrazing. It's getting that balance right. And that's why, you know, governments and policy makers should be listening to the farmers. Nobody's come to ask us how that scheme's gone since 2006. You know, that's a heck of a shame that they can't see how the habitats have changed you know, and how we're moving sheep into different areas because we think there's not quite enough grazing there or there's just a little bit too many sheep there. And we're noticing, if anything, that there's undergrazing. So there's dikes for 15,000 sheep here, but we only keep about 9,000. There's less young people coming into the job. There's less um, people having an understanding because you, you cannot farm this land without being parts of it you have to have an understanding you have to have the knowledge and that comes from hundreds of years that's passed down and there's a well saying a so when when a, a chick is born in hell he can live in hell he can survive in hell and this place can be hell on earth but it could be paradise as well and we need to have an understanding of how we can bring the next generation onto this land, making sure they have a fair price for what they're producing and they're having a fair price for protecting these habitats and watching after them. And that's really, really important. 
and not one policy will sort this. They have to look at different policies for every individual farm because every individual farm's different. My farm will be different to next door's farm and they'll have different habitats. That's what they have to understand, that these one policies doesn't fit all. The habitats, the wildlife, you know, has to be protected, but some things will need to be protected in different ways. And that's why we need to look at these policies. We are at a massive turning point. There's no doubt in my mind. Agriculture is, you know, a big part of Wales, was a big part of Great Britain, but there's a lot of environmentalists, there's a lot of peer pressure, you know, to stop livestock and to stop livestock farming. And I think it's wrong. I think we have to look at the balance of how important livestock are, you know, sheep on the uplands, grazing, making sure that they're watching after these different habitats. We have to get the numbers right. We can't overgraze, we can't undergraze. Cattle are an absolute priority for our soil, fertility and health. You know, and, and these animals are giving us top quality protein. You know, and, and we get a bonus from sheep, which is wool, and which we don't utilize enough. And we should be, you know, selling it and making sure that we're using a lot more of it. But these policies have got to come from the people in power in Welsh Government and they can't be pressurised only from the environmentalists. They have to have an understanding of working farms because these working farms can have habitats for wildlife that are so varied but we need to protect both. We need to make sure that these farmers are being paid right for the produce they're producing but paid right as well for the conservation work they're doing and the protection of clean water and uh, making sure that you know our habitats are protected for the next generation so please listen to the farmers get out there on farms talk to individuals find out where their strengths are and where we can spend the money that's coming from the taxpayer to protect our habitats, but to produce food at an affordable rate for people as well. And that's really important. And that balance is going to be difficult, but it has to be done right.